Hi, my name is Sarah Temkin and I'm the lead clinical pharmacist at Personalized Prescribing. Today we're going to go over how a, the way that a patient metabolizes medications could affect their drug response. And we're going to give a little bit of background about how we apply pharmacogenomics at Personalized Prescribing. Uh, so I'm going to start off by comparing pharmacogenetics to pharmacogenomics. So both of these approaches involve the study of inherited genetic differences, which can affect response to medications. Pharmacogenetics, however, involves the study of only one gene at a time. Now, several pharmacogenetic testing companies, they would say, you know, gene A can reduce response to sertraline. But this can be confusing for patients because these companies can also say, but gene B can increase response to sertraline. And so the patient goes, I'm a little bit confused here. Should I take sertraline or not? You're giving me conflicting information. And so it's not enough to study one gene at a time. It's important to look at the totality of response. So that is why at Personalized Prescribing, we take a pharmacogenomic approach. We study more than one gene at a time to look at the totality of drug response or the final response that the patient will get. And this allows us to be able to provide an actual recommendation and say, you know, you have a low likelihood of response to sertraline, so it might be best to try another alternative first. So it's also important to understand the difference between pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics. Pharmacokinetics is the study of the way that a patient metabolizes a medication at the level of the liver. Uh, and so it's a study of these enzymes involved in metabolism versus pharmacodynamics, which involves the genes that code the target sites of action. So for example, for antidepressants, we would be looking at the brain receptors involved in the final drug response. Now, as I mentioned, what is unique to personalized prescribing is we take a pharmacogenomic approach as it is not enough that a drug is able to be cleared normally by the body. It's not enough that a patient is a normal metabolizer and that the drug reaches a normal concentration in the body. This drug must also attach to its target receptor to elicit the final intended response. The pharmacogenomic test that we have at Personalized Prescribing is the most comprehensive test in Canada. I cannot stress that enough. Most companies test only 14 to 16 genes, mostly pharmacokinetic. We test more than 50 genes for more than 100 medications, and we test both pharmacokinetic and pharmacodynamic genes. We are also a Canadian testing company. All testing is done in a lab in Canada. The patient's genetic information is protected that way, and I'll explain why in the upcoming slides. Our genetic panel is also proprietary to us. We do not resell someone's genetic panel from the States. Uh, we do test our own genes. This also allows us to do research and development uh, and continuously improve our panel as we discover things by talking to patients. So our pharmacists actually look at genetic patterns as well. It's not enough to look at the lit literature. When you're taking a pharmacogenomic approach, you're doing something that hasn't been done by the literature ever before, which is looking at multiple genes at the same time and how they're interacting with each other. Now, we're able to now, uh, for example, provide a percentage likelihood of response to medications, but sometimes we're also discovering that, you know, sometimes these genes that are affecting response, they could also be linked to anxiety as a side effect on a medication. So this is very unique to us. We do continuous quality improvement and we seek to always improve upon our recommendations as more and more information comes to us. So we are involved also in data analytics, we do not, of course, share this genetic information with other companies. We only use this information to be able to better care for our patients. Now, why is it important that a patient is tested in Canada? Well, there's definitely potential for genetic discrimination and misuse of information in countries where there are no protections in place for patients. For example, in the States, there's something called the Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act, or GINA, which was intended to protect individuals in the US from discrimination based on their genetic data. However, interestingly, this act does not apply to life insurance, long-term insurance, or disability insurance. So based on a pharmacogenetic test, any of these insurance companies can discriminate against patients and say, you know, we're not going to cover you because you had a pre-existing mental illness or predisposition to lack of response to multiple medications, or they might have higher insurance premiums for these patients. But in Canada, there are greater protections in place where we have the Genetic Non-Discrimination Act that applies to all forms of insurance. And I'm going to go over this act in more detail. This 
Genetic Non-Discrimination Act, which was released in 2017, prohibits companies and employers from requiring genetic testing or the results of genetic tests. Um, so an insurance company in Canada cannot ask a patient for the results of genetic testing before deciding coverage. That's considered illegal. This act also prevents companies, including all insurers, from denying services based on the results of genetic tests. And like in the US, the genetic test cannot prevent an individual from receiving long-term disability and life insurance in Canada. We're going to go over exactly what this act says. So in this act, it is stated that it is prohibited for any person to require an individual to undergo a genetic test as a condition of providing goods or services to that individual, entering into or continuing a contract or agreement with that individual, or offering or continuing specific terms or conditions in a contract or agreement with that individual. To summarize, no insurance company or no individual can ask someone to do a genetic test in order to decide whether or not to provide goods and services. So this is a very comprehensive act. This act also requires a patient's written consent prior to enabling uh, personalized prescribing or anyone from sharing someone's genetic information. So that is why at personalized prescribing, all patients that come to us must sign a, a written consent form before we are able to proceed with testing. It's for legal reasons. In this consent form, what is required in order to proceed with testing is a patient's first name, last name, contact information, and signature. There are other optional fields in the consent form, which include, uh, for example, a patient's uh, medical conditions, some of the drugs that they have tried in the past, and but this is really optional from a legal standpoint. What we really need is the patient's information and signature. It also helps that if the patient wants to share the results with a healthcare provider, this information is best provided in the consent form. So for example, if a patient wanted to share their genetic information with their doctor, they should include the doctor's first name and last name, as well as any co contact information available for that physician. This will allow us to share these results with the patient's physician. Uh, for pharmacists that are providing the service in their pharmacy, uh, they must follow these legal requirements. They must have the patient sign a written consent form before proceeding with testing. Just like in any field in medicine, there are guidelines. Pharmacogenetics is no different. There are guidelines released by multiple groups. The gold standard for guidelines in North America is the Clinical Pharmacogenetics Implementation Consortium, also known as CPIC. This is an organization of geneticists, pharmacists, physicians, psychiatrists, who look at the genetic information, uh, look at the literature, and come up with pharmacogenetic recommendations for patients and guidelines for how to proceed for patients with certain genetic variations. There are also other guideline committees in Europe. One is the Dutch Pharmacogenetics Working Group, the DPWG. There's also the Canadian Pharmacogenomics Network for Drug Safety, uh, obviously based in Canada, the CPNDS. And you can also look at FDA drug labels because they also have pharmacogenetic recommendations for medications where genes are highly uh, involved in response to the medication. Now, I would say when starting out, when, when in doubt, check the CPIC guidelines. If there are gaps in the literature in terms of how uh, this metabolic gene may be linked to drug response, then you can refer to the DPWG, CPNDS, and the FDA drug labels. All of these guidelines, you can find them at www.farmgkb.org. So I'm just going to open farmgkb right over here so we can take a look at it together. So let's take a look at FarmGKB. So here you can search by, as, as stated here, you can search by molecule, by gene, by variant, or a combination of these things. So let's say I'm interested in learning more about sertraline. So I am just going to click here. And here you can find a lot of information. Uh, you can find important prescribing information. So all the guidelines, which linked sertraline to the, the metabolism gene CYP2C19, as well as CYP2D6, with CYP2C19 being the main gene involved in sertraline metabolism. Now there's no drug label annotations, but there's what's known as clinical annotations, uh, letting you know the level of evidence associated uh, with linking a gene to response to a, a drug. So for example, 
the level of evidence linking the response at CYP, the gene CYP2C19 to response to sertraline is level 1A. Let's click read now and look at this in more detail. So here it will tell you what the allele combination is and what that means in terms of response for a patient. Um, as well, you can look at what are known as variant annotations, uh, which look at other variants that the literature has linked to drug response, but that this pharmacogenetic uh, knowledge base has not yet given a level of evidence. You can also look at the literature. Um, you can look at, for example, the PharmGKB summary for the, the sertraline pathway. You can also look at each of the pharmacodynamic and pharmacokinetic pathways in more detail. So for example, for sertraline, here are all the enzymes involved in response. And then, so as you can see, this is a really, really good resource for understanding drugs. I can also search by gene. So I can search for CYP2C19, see you know what CYP2C19 is. So this is really an amazing resource. You can also go to the main pharmgkb.org website and look at clinical guidelines. So let me press that. So as you can see, there are guidelines by the different associations and how they're linked to the different genes. And you can go over them and you can see the different drugs on the side. Um, and so this is just an amazing, amazing resource for pharmacists and anyone who's working in this field. Now I'm gonna go back to our PowerPoint presentation now. Okay. So I'm going to go over genetics as an overview. Many of us already have this background from our pharmacy degree, but I think it's good, a good idea to go over it again, um, given that we're now specialists in this field. So a gene is a portion of the DNA that determines a specific trait, and an allele is a specific form of a gene. Uh, so alleles occur in pair, pairs. You usually get one from the mom and one from the dad. So for example, for the gene CYP2D6, which is uh, one of the genes involved in metabolizing medications, uh, you could have a star one, star one allele. So star one is really just a designation for an, uh, an allele. And in this case, this patient has the star one from the mom, star one from the dad, and this combination makes this patient a normal metabolizer. Now alleles themselves, so the star one allele can be composed of one or more single nucleotide polymorphisms known as SNPs. Alleles can also be deletions, insertions, or additions. Um, now I'm going to be focusing on single nucleotide polymorphisms because in most cases, the, the genes that we test, uh, the alleles are usually composed of, uh, composed of these single nucleotide polymorphism genetic variations. Now these SNPs, which I'll be calling them, uh, they're denoted by what's known as an RSID. So for example, for st the STAR1 allele, there could be one of the single nucleotide polymorphisms or SNPs could be RS928506. And you could have several of these RSIDs or SNPs that together compose that allele. So note that SNPs do not always lead to new alleles. However, sometimes they can occur in non-coding regions. This is just a little bit of genetic background. Now at personalized prescribing, we won't be expecting uh, the pharmacists that are applying this in their pharmacy to be looking at the single nucleotide polymorphisms that compose that allele. Mostly you'll be just looking at the allele combination and what that means in terms of the phenotype or the ultimate drug response for that patient. I'm just providing with a little bit of genetic background, just in case you were um, curious to understand how these SNPs relate to these alleles. So ultimately to summarize, there, are, there can be one or more SNPs and the combination of these SNPs compose these alleles and the two the, the pair of alleles are what ultimately determine um, the metabolism phenotype or the ultimate uh, metabolism result for that patient. Now we went over pharmgkb.org as a demo. Um, so for example, in order to, so this is what's known as an allele definition table. You can find these in PharmGKB uh, for the different genes. This is just, again, a little bit of genetic background. You may or may not find it useful is just really to, so that we kind of understand, you know, when geneticists talk about SNPs, what they're referring to.
So for example, for uh, the CYP2D6 allele star 2A that we see over here, which is a normal functioning allele, which denotes normal metabolism, you can see that there are different genetic variations. So the two SNPs that are important here is the RS1080985, where G was replaced with a C. We also have the RS2 uh, 2873-5595, where the T was replaced with a C, and other SNPs with the other variations. So as we can see here, it's the multiple SNPs, the, the SNP that has the C, the C, and the A that together determine the star 2A allele which designates normal function. So usually what geneticists will do is to figure out what allele the patient have, they will look at the combination of SNPs or RSIDs. We won't be doing that as pharmacists, but it's really interesting to be able to better understand um, genetic lingo if we're going to be dealing with geneticists and patients and healthcare providers who may have further questions. This is not really clinically relevant in a, in, in a sense that you won't be using the SNPs to be providing medication recommendations. You'll just be using the individual alleles and their combination to tell the patient what their phenotype or what their ultimate metabolism will be. So we'll take a look at the CYP2D6 gene. So there's a scoring system, uh, which generally PharmGKB recommends and CPIC recommends in terms of how to, to determine metabolism for a patient. So the STAR1 and the STAR2 normal alleles, which have normal activity, um, normal metabolic activity are given a score of one. Um, the, the alleles star 3, star 4 to 8, and star 14a are given an activity of 0. They reduce activity for CYP2D6. Uh, or uh, there's no, no absolutes. It's impossible to tell a patient that you're, you have you know, no activity in your CYP2D6 gene. This is just a scoring system to help us better understand who the poor metabolizers are. But for, for Calculation reasons, CPIC recommends a score of zero for the star three, star four to eight, and star 14 A alleles. Now, star nine, star 10, star 17, star 29, and star 41 are known as actually reduced activity alleles, which means it it's, has some function there, um, and it's not as bad as the star three, star four to eight, et cetera, the no activity alleles. Now, in order to look at whether a patient is a normal, intermediate, poor, or ultra-rapid metabolizer, you have to total the scores for a patient. So for example, a patient can have a star one, star one designation. So he has one star one copy from the mom, one star one copy from the dad. So their total score would be one plus one, which equals two. So according to this table here that we have, where his total score of 1.5 to two is normal, this patient is able to clear medications normally. For an intermediate metabolizer, as you can see, there's a scoring system, 0.5 to one. This patient may have a slightly reduced ability to metabolize medications and thus they may be more sensitive to dose related side effects for a poor metabolizer which has a total score of zero as i mentioned before there's no such thing as zero metabolism but it's just a scoring system that helps us understand poor metabolism so these patients they metabolize medications so slowly that they're at such high risk of side effects we also have ultra rapid metabolizers with the cyp2d6 gene this is what's unique to cyp2d6 that you can actually have more than what's known as more than two N, so more than two copies. You can actually have three or four copies of the CYP2D6 gene. So your CYP2D6 gene is working over time. These ultra rapid metabolizers, they clear medications so quickly, they're at risk of low efficacy. Now you'll see some resources referring to normal metabolizers as extensive metabolizers that basically just refers to the same thing. Someone who's able to clear medications normally. So let's look at an example patient. So we have a patient with a CYP2D6 star 1 star 4 allele. So they had, for example, star 1 from the mom and star 4 from the dad. What kind of metabolizers is this patient? So let's look at the scoring system here. So star 1, that would be the score of 1. Star 4, that would be a score of 0. So let's add and total these. So 1 plus 0 equals a total score of 1. So what does that mean for the patient? If we look at the total score here, that makes the patient an intermediate metabolizer. So they're more sensitive to the dose-related side effects of the medication. Now, what if a patient tests a CYP2D6 star 9 star 10? What kind of metabolizers 
is this patient? So let's look at star nine. So star nine over here designates reduced activity, a score of 0.5. Star 10 as well is a reduced activity allele, a score of 0.5. So basically they had one pair from the mom, for example, which has a 0.5 score, one pair from the dad, which has a 0.5 score. The total score is one. So guess what? This patient is also still an intermediate metabolizer. So they may be more sensitive to the dose related side effects of medications. Now let's look at a patient who's star 14, a star four. What does that mean? So star 14, a designates a score of zero. Star four also designates a score of zero. Total score of zero, what does that make the patient? Well, it makes them a poor metabolizer. If we look at the total score table, oops. So if you look at the total score table here, uh, this patient is a very poor metabolizer and they're at high risk of side effects on medications. You, depending on what the CPIC guidelines say, you might wanna use a very low dose of the medication or a completely alternative medication. What if a patient is a star one, star two, uh, greater than two copies. So what does that mean? So if the greater than two copies was for the star two allele, um, assuming that's where we have multiple copies, we will usually indicate that for you. And usually we do the scoring system. We score these alleles ourselves and we come up with a total score. Um, and we will tell you what that means for the patient in terms of whether they're normal, intermediate, poor, or ultra rapid. This is something that our software will automatically do for you. I think it's just a really good idea to be able to understand how the software comes up with this final result um, and to be able to understand what these alleles mean in case you wanted to uh, explain this to healthcare providers or they were to have more questions. So in this case, the star one allele, as you can see here, there's a score of one. The star two allele also has a score of one. Now we have two copies of the star two allele, so that would make it one plus one plus the second copy of the star two allele, so plus another one, which makes the total score of three. Therefore, if we have a total score of three, so greater than two, that would make this patient an ultra rapid metabolizer who is very uh, at risk of low efficacy from the medication and has a low likelihood of response. You may wanna choose an alternative medication if this is what CPIC guidelines recommend for ultra rapid metabolizers. Now, CPIC also mentions that some reference labs would classify a total score of one as a normal metabolizer, whereas others would classify the patient as an intermediate metabolizer. We prefer to be more conservative. So for the intermediate metabolizers here, anyone who's 0.5 to one, we consider intermediate uh, because we wanna pick up those patients who are maybe more sensitive to dose related side effects of medications. Some other labs, they might say, well, one, that's pretty close to normal, so we're gonna say this patient's a normal metabolizer. Uh, we prefer to be more sensitive for patients, so we can at least caution them um, that if they were to be closer to the intermediate range, um, that they should be more careful and titrate a medication more slowly due to their greater risk of side effects. Also, if a patient is an intermediate metabolizer, for example, for the CYP2D6 gene, if they were taking a CYP2D6 gene inhibitor, for example, bupropion. So let's say that a patient is on paroxetine, a medication that's metabolized by CYP2D6, and they were to take bupropion, a CYP2D6 inhibitor. If they were an intermediate metabolizer, inhibiting further metabolism, could make this patient, as we've talked about medications that when they're metabolized, are metabolized into their inactive forms. As we know as pharmacists, prodrugs are completely different. When they're metabolized, they're actually metabolized into their active forms. So for a prodrug, a normal metabolizer with a total score of two is actually able to convert this medication into its active form. But the meaning of intermediate, poor, and ultra rapid metabolizer for a patient taking a prodrug is completely different from a patient who's taking a drug that when it's metabolized, it becomes inactive. In this case, an intermediate metabolizer is not someone who is more sensitive to medications or is slightly at increased risk of side effects. It's someone who's able to convert some of the medication into its active form. So this medication may not be as effective. It might be slightly less effective. So we need to be careful with these patients. They may need a higher dose. A poor metabolizer for a prodrug is someone who's not able to convert this medication into its active form. So this medication uh, may be not effective at all for the patient. It might be like taking a sugar pill. This is very different from the previous case that we talked about, where a poor metabolizer is someone who has the active medication building up their blood in their bloodstream and who is at increased risk of side effects because they're not able to convert this active medication into its inactive form. 
So prodrugs are completely different. An ultra-rapid metabolizer who has more than two copies for a prodrug is able to convert a high proportion of the medication into its active form and thus may be able to uh, experience more side effects on the medication. So as an example, tamoxifen is a prodrug. So in whom would you avoid the use of tamoxifen for breast cancer? Um, this is very important, actually, because, of course, we're talking about cancer here and the consequences can be huge. To answer this question, it's in poor metabolizers because this medication will not be effective because uh, it's not being converted enough into its active form. So in this situation, as per guidelines, you want to use an alternative. You want to use anastrozole, uh, an alternative anti-cancer agent that's not metabolized by CYP2D6, and you would need to combine that with ovarian ablation. So which drugs are metabolized by CYP2D6? Here I'm going to focus mainly on psychiatry and pain control because that's where pharmacogenetics or pharmacogenomics tends to have the most uh, evidence in terms of really helping patients. Uh, and it's only mainly because when it comes to the psychiatric medications, there's only two main genes involved in metabolism. There are a few other ones, but the main ones are CYP2D6 and CYP2C19. In fact, CYP2D6 is responsible for the metabolism of 25% of the most commonly prescribed medications on the market right now. It's responsible for the metabolism of the antipsychotics, as we can see here, haloperidol and risperidone with risperidone being a prodrug. I've starred all the prodrugs here. Um, and it's also CYP2D6 is involved in the metabolism of the majority of the antidepressants on the market, duloxetine, fluoxetine, fluvoxamine, mirtazapine, the list goes on and on, including tricyclic antidepressants. So someone who has a problem with CYP2D6 has a major problem with psychiatric medications. Uh, as well as CYP2D6 is involved in the metabolism of a lot of the ADHD medications, all of them actually, the stimulants and the non-stimulants, the stimulants being amphetamine, uh, Adderall uh, XR, or Adderall short release, methylphenidate, also known as Concerta or Ritalin, and Etamoxetine, also known as Stratera. Um, now, CYP2D6 has more of a minor influence on methylphenidate and etamoxetine, uh, so the consequences are not as big, but the consequences are huge for amphetamine. It is a major enzyme. So for example, what would you do if a patient was a poor metabolizer of amphetamine? Well, in this case, uh, given that this is not a prodrug, this is a medication that's an active drug in and of itself, then a poor metabolizer is someone who breaks down amphetamines more slowly and may be at increased risk of these side effects. The main side effects of amphetamine being insomnia and appetite suppression. So in patients who are CYP2D6 poor metabolizers, especially in children who may be prescribed ADHD medications, you want to caution the doctor that a highly reduced dose may be required in some situations, this dose is not even available on the market. So if you want to half the starting dose, you might want to even consider getting this, this uh, medication uh, specifically compounded by specialty pharmacies. Uh, another example would be uh, cardiovascular medications, uh, which is such as, for example, metoprolol, beta blocker, uh, as well as opioids, mostly codeine hydrocodone and oxycodone, basically codeine and codeine derivatives, which are all prodrugs and need to be metabolized by CYP2D6 to become active. Another example would be tramadol. This also needs to be uh, metabolized to become active. Uh, oncology medications such as tamoxifen are also, of course, uh, metabolized by CYP2D6. So let's go through uh, a little bit more information about what to do in terms of drug interactions when it comes to different metabolizers of CYP2D6. For intermediate or per metabolizers, it's very important not to combine the antidepressants mentioned in the table from the previous slide. So these ones, duloxetine, fluoxetine, fluvoxamine, et cetera, not to combine them with strong CYP2D6 inhibitors such as bupropion, as this is likely to further reduce metabolism. So someone who's intermediate or poor, they're not metabolizing this drug as much as we would like. And if we combine that with the CYP2D6, such as uh, bupropion, we're further reducing metabolize, uh, metabolism and further increasing the risk of side effects for this patient. So this patient, for example, who may be taking, let's say, tricyclic antidepressants as an example, uh, and as we know, the, the side effects of tricyclic antidepressants could be orthostatic hypertension, anticholinergic side effects, problems with concentration, urinary retention. If they were intermediate or poor metabolizers and you combine that with a CYP2D6 inhibitor like bupropion, they will experience these side effects much, much more. 
especially considering these side effects are dose related. Of course, not all side effects are dose related, but as we know, uh, problems related to blood pressure, such as orthostatic hypertension and anticholinergic side effects are dose related side effects. Interestingly, of the medications listed in the, in the table here, paroxetine, fluoxetine, and fluvoxamine are also strong CYP2D6 inhibitors. So not only are these medications metabolized by CYP2D6, but they also inhibit their own metabolism over time. That is why these medications do not exhibit a linear dose response profile where you would say the higher the dose, uh, the side effects increase proportionally to the dose, not so much because the higher you, uh, with time, let's say this patient has been taking this medication at a really low dose for four months, uh, because these medications inhibit their own metabolism, a low dose can become more of a, uh, for example, moderate dose for the patient. And so they may be at increased risk of side effects over time. So it's important with these medications to titrate them much more slowly. And you don't want to combine the medications in, uh, in the table over here, the antidepressants, with the CYP2D6 inducers either, such as carbamazepine, phenytoin, rifampin, as well as phenobarbital. Mainly we're talking about anticonvulsants here, as well as the antibiotic rifampin uh, and any other CYP2D6 inducer. You really don't want to, you want to avoid combining them. Uh, with these medications, if possible. Uh, otherwise, uh, you'd have to really caution the patient that their antidepressant may not be effective. Perhaps um, if, for example, the patient is taking rifampin, maybe you would need a dose increase for just that duration of therapy, temporary dose increase. Of course, it becomes more complicated if we're talking about anticonvulsants. In this case, you need a more permanent dose increase, uh, especially if the seizures are lifelong. Nonlinear metabolism for paroxetine, one of the antidepressants that does have this type of metabolism. And this is just a picture that shows the PharmGKB uh, pathway for paroxetine metabolism. As you can see here, PharmGKB has denoted with this dark line that CYP2D6 is a major enzyme involved in paroxetine metabolism with minor contribution from CYP3A4, CYP1A2, and other enzymes. We're gonna focus on CYP2D6 because that's the major enzyme and that's the enzyme that actually has uh, metabolism recommendations by major guidelines. As you can see here, the PharmGKB pathway has also shown that paroxetine inhibits its own metabolism with time. Specifically, that happens at prolonged paroxetine exposure. So someone who has been on paroxetine for a month or so. And it happens especially at higher doses. It can therefore change the metabolism phenotype of an individual who has been defined by their genotype or the allele combination that they have. So a number of studies show that phenotypic CYP2D6 normal metabolizers can have a decrease in CYP2D6 activity after prolonged paroxetine treatment and some may even convert to slow metabolizers or act like phenotypic poor metabolizers, especially at higher paroxetine doses. So someone who takes paroxetine at a low dose may behave completely differently on paroxetine at higher doses or uh, with prolonged exposure. So after a month of treatment, they may be at increased risk of side effects than they were in the beginning. So you may wanna consider a uh, dose reduction if that were the case. I also wanted to highlight other important parts of this pathway. I know the focus of this specific PowerPoint presentation is going to be metabolism, but I wanna to touch on an important gene. Um, it's specifically ABCB1, it's a pharmacodynamic gene. It's not involved in metabolism at all. It's involved in preventing the entry of toxins into the brain through the blood-brain barrier. ABCB1 does have its function when there are toxins around. However, certain antidepressants can also be a substrate of ABCB1, paroxetine being one of them. In this case, ABCB1 sometimes can prevent the entry of paroxetine into the brain. Uh, and most people have a basal ABCB1 function, which is known as normal function. Um, and that's been taken into account uh, in terms of deciding dosing. Um, and when these, uh, these companies who came up with paroxetine decided dosing, um, it was based on patients that have normal ABCB1 uh, transporter or efflux transporter. Uh, in this case though, some patients have ABCB1 working overtime, preventing uh, paroxetine from entering into the brain. We test for ABCB1 and variants 
in ABCB1 for that reason. These patients who have ABCB1 efflux transporter working overtime may have so much paroxetine being effluxed out of the blood-brain barrier um, that at normally prescribed doses, paroxetine may not get the chance to enter the brain. They may need higher doses, um, but paroxetine uh, metabolism is a major, major contributor to dosing. ABCB1 uh, is a, more of a minor contributor and only comes really becomes clinically significant in cases where patients are also experiencing a lot of peripheral side effects. Because if you can imagine, if a lot of the drug is going to your periphery and going to your bloodstream instead of entering your brain, you're more at risk of peripheral side effects such as sweating, um, gastrointestinal side effects such as nausea. I've had patients who experienced weird side effects on sertraline or Zoloft. And sertraline generally tends to be a tolerable antidepressant. But in the case where someone has an overactive ABCB1 transporter, um, they are pumping this drug so much into the periphery uh, that this drug builds up. That becomes even more relevant for patients who are poor metabolizers that already have high concentrations. If you have high concentrations of the drug in your bloodstream to begin with, um, and then you top that up with ABCB1 that's kicking this drug out of the brain, um, then you have someone who's really, really sensitive to peripheral side effects. I've had patients who experienced, uh, for example, weird electric shock-like feelings in, in, their, in their hands and arms, um, and they tended to be um, ABCB1 over transporters. So these are all important things to consider when providing medication recommendations to patients. So I'm going to summarize here um, that there's different enzymes involved in metabolizing many antidepressants. The reason why I focus on antidepressants is because these are the patients that benefit the most from pharmacogenetic testing. You can have pharmacogenetic testing for someone who's uh, new to antidepressants, who has never taken an antidepressant in their life, um, because it helps to know, instead of you trying multiple drugs, it helps to know, will this drug work for you the first time around? Uh, 40 to 50 percent of patients who have depression fail the first antidepressant that they try. So keep that in mind. Um, this test also helps for treatment resistant patients because then you can really hone down which medication um, they should be focusing on instead of them having to try multiple medications. In this case, you can see the major antidepressants metabolized by CYP2D6. It's really the majority of antidepressants. There's few, few of them that are metabolized by CYP2C19, them being citalopram or Celexa, Ecitalopram or Ciprolex and sertraline Zoloft. So if you really needed to memorize medications, I would recommend memorizing the ones metabolized by CYP2C19, since by exclusion, mostly everything else is metabolized by CYP2D6. Now in this case, all tricyclic antidepressants, with few exceptions, are metabolized by both CYP2D6 and CYP2C19. So that's that may be why people may be prone to more side effects on tricyclic antidepressants. There are a few exceptions. Dicipramine and nortriptyline are metabolized mostly by CYP2D6. Now, there are also antidepressants that are great options for patients who have a metabolism problem in both CYP2D6 and CYP2C19. Uh, so that we've ruled out these options as well as these options if it's a major metabolism problem. Um, in this case, you would want to use an antidepressant that's preferably not metabolized by either enzyme, provided this patient also had a high likelihood of response from a pharmacodynamic perspective, which is something that I'm going to cover in a completely different PowerPoint slide. Now, there are rare situations where you might want to use a medication uh, if, for example, if a patient is a CYP2D6 or CYP2C19 intermediate metabolizer or per metabolizer, there are situations based on the drug and the CPIC guidelines where you may still want to use these antidepressants if the patient has a high likelihood of response from a pharmacodynamic perspective. But if we're talking from a purely metabolism um, standpoint, then if a patient was a poor metabolizer, um, these would be alternatives, desvelofaxine and levomilnacipran, since they're not metabolized by either enzyme. Um, I hope I haven't confused anyone here. If th there are any questions regarding the slide, please feel free to contact me. Now I'm going to go over a few case studies. Uh, so let's say there's a patient named JR who has been responding well to paroxetine for the treatment of his anxiety with a few side effects. However, he is still experiencing some symptoms of depression and lack of motivation. His physician decided to add bupropion to his regimen to help with the residual symptoms of depression. Bupropion is one of those antidepressants that only helps depression. It does not help anxiety. It tends to be an add-on that can help with any residual symptoms that the patient may have. 
So the addition of bupropion to JR's regimen resulted in stomach upset, nausea, and dizziness. These symptoms persisted despite the fact that JR has been on this combination for about a month. In addition, the patient has indicated that he felt no added benefit from the addition of bupropion to his regimen. He actually felt more depressed. JR was referred to personalized prescribing, and the results indicated that he is a CYP2D6 star 2 star 4 intermediate metabolizer. So in this case, whenever a patient is tested, our software will indicate to you what these star alleles mean in terms of uh, metabolism for a patient. Another thing you can do um, is if for, for, uh, for whatever reason you wanted to check what different alleles mean, let's go to farmgkb.org. So let's go to farmgkb and I'm just going to show you what it looks like from the beginning. We're going to type in paroxetine. And we're gonna to go to prescribing info. I'm gonna focus on the CPIC guideline information. That's a gold standard. And I'm gonna type in the patient's alleles, star two, star four. And as we can see here, the CPIC guidelines also indicate that this patient is an intermediate metabolizer. And this is automatically calculated for me by PharmGKB as well. Uh, you don't have to worry about that generally because we will be providing that information to you through our software. Okay. So this patient was uh, tolerating paroxetine. It worked really well for their anxiety, but they had some depression. Bupropion was added, but then all of a sudden they started experiencing all these side effects and bupropion didn't help all that much with their depression. So what could be going on here? What's behind the scenes and what advice would you give JR and his physician? So in this case, JR is an intermediate metabolizer. This means he's more sensitive to the dose related side effects of paroxetine he may be more likely to respond to the lower dose range of this medication. So consider a dose reduction. The addition of bupropion to JR's regimen resulted in the inhibition of metabolism of paroxetine via CYP2D6. So that's why the patient was all of a sudden experiencing the stomach upset, the nausea, and dizziness, which are tend to be paroxetine side effects. Bupropion is also worsening this patient's depression from a pharmacodynamic perspective. So in this case,